You're listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truths in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. Well, good evening and uh, welcome to our service tonight. We want to bid you greetings in the, the precious and the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. It's been a fairly hectic uh, week or so with Christmas and New Year's and, and then again this morning, but uh, we just rejoice. But we welcome you and we pray that this service will unfold to your glory or to God's glory and you will give him the praise rather. And then uh, we just want you as we begin our service uh, uh, tonight we want you to enjoy uh, this uh, song. Amazing grace shall always be my song of praise for it was grace Brother Noel uh, read that uh, passage to us. Uh, I was thinking back to the time uh, a little while back when I was preparing this message in this particular series and wondering just how uh, I would perhaps approach uh, all of the different aspects of that particular passage that uh, was read for us. I pondered about that and so I begin today or tonight with a quote from William, William Barclay's work and I'm probably not a big fan of William Barclay uh, in some of his beliefs but uh, some of the historical things that he quotes are quite accurate and his development of many of the Greek words are quite accurate. 
But I want to begin with a quote from his work, The Gospel of Luke Daily Study Bible Series. And I just want you to listen to the quote. When I was a lad, the old man confessed to loved ones gathered during his last hours of life. I often played on a wide common. Near its centre, two roads met and crossed, and standing at the crossroads was an old rickety signpost. A troubled frown clouded his face. I remember one day twisting it round in its socket, thus altering the arms and making them point in the wrong direction. And I've been wondering ever since, he said, how many travellers I sent on the wrong road. End of quote. And whether it be a long country road or a path of life, I want to suggest to you that leading people astray exacts a heavy toll on both the innocent and the guilty. And the precious word of God says, Scripture says that each of us has the potential of causing others to go wrong. Each of us, if we are not careful in the outliving of our faith, can become what the Bible calls a stumbling block. And the truth is, uh, right from the blocks here tonight, right from the start, we can hinder people from following Christ in at least three ways. First, by what we say. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says... uh, And let me just quote to you from James 3, verses 1 and 2. He says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. I have to confess that that scripture haunts me. And then he goes on to say, We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. And since we all know that one person, that we all know that one person, the person of Christ, is perfect, we also know as we sit in this church tonight that we are bound to stumble in what we actually say. And James, as he writes under the inspiration of the Spirit of God, singles out those of us who instruct or counsel others simply because these positions carry with them more influence. And by incorrectly, inaccurately, or carelessly teaching God's truth, what can happen is if we do that, we can trip many people up who genuinely yearn to follow Christ. Second, we can become stumbling blocks simply by the way that we actually live. And the Apostle Paul, for example, uh, cautions us not to flaunt our freedom in Christ. And we have great freedom in Christ. But in 1 Corinthians 8 9, he says this, Be careful, however, that the, ex- that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. You see, without love's restraint, we can disfigure grace with arrogance and disregard for others. Our actions can confuse weaker Christians, leading them to violate their consciences per se and return to their former way of life, return to their former sins. Third, we can become stumbling blocks by the way we think. Our judgmental attitudes can feel like quicksand to others, smothering their joy and their excitement in Christ. And the Apostle Paul exhorts us in Romans 14, 13, he says this, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in your brother's way. Now, the reason I started with those uh, several verses is simply this, that God's message couldn't be clearer. God says, don't be a stumbling block. Don't put a stumbling block in the path of someone in the faith. 
In fact, over in Luke chapter 17, Jesus even thunders a woe to those who make hazardous the paths of, of others' lives. So if you haven't already, let's turn to his word now. Luke chapter 17, which will help us clear rather than obstruct the way for fellow travelers trying to follow him. With a telling glance at the Pharisees, Jesus warns his disciples in verse 1. Follow along. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come. But woe to that person through whom they come. The New American Standard Version records verse 1 this way, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks should come. But woe to him through whom they actually come. The Greek word translated stumbling blocks or things that cause people to sin is the little, uh, or the, the Greek word scandalon, which means simply this, the bait stick of a trap, that which triggers off trouble. And what Jesus is saying here in this particular portion of scripture is simply this, that people are bound to wander into temptation and feel the consequences like steel jaws snap shut on their lives. But woe to the one who sets the trap. Woe to the adult who leads the innocent child into sin. Woe to the preacher who deceives the gullible believer. And there are many who are doing that in the pulpits of our land today. Woe to the counselor who seduces the emotionally fragile client. Woe to the legalistic Pharisee who misrepresents God. Now, concerning those who bring harm, look what Jesus says in Luke 17.2. It would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone around, tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin or to stumble. Have you ever seen a millstone? It's a large circular stone that rests flat on top of another. And an axle is fitted through the center of it and an ox pulls it in a, a circle to pulverize raw grain into fine powder. And since so it is much too heavy to lift, the stone would be rolled into the sea and down you'd go with it. That's the, the imagery that Jesus uses. And he uses this frightful image to make a vivid point. And the vivid point is this. This horrid death would be a better end than the judgment for leading someone astray, leading someone away from God. So watch yourselves. Be on your guard, Jesus cautions his disciples in that third verse. Don't just cluck your tongue at the Pharisees. Take heed of yourselves. Be careful that you do not become a stumbling block. Be careful through the way that you live that you don't lead, leave others, lead others away from Christ. And then Jesus next uh, gives some preventative counsel. So we learn how to avoid becoming a stumbling block. And I must confess that Jesus' message in these verses seems to jump from point to point like a, you know, a rock skipping across water. You know, you've seen that because there's so many little, little sub-things in this particular passage that was read. Yet if we look closely, great depth and power lie beneath the surface of each particular subject that Jesus addresses. A failure to forgive may also cause, be a cause of stumbling. Follow along in verses 3 and 4. He says, If your brother sins, rebuke him. 
And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. Now I want to suggest to you that the rebuke part comes more natural to us than the forgive part, doesn't it? Like the Pharisees, we feel a sense of satisfaction in hooking an offender with, with a well-cast rebuke and reeling in that little old rascal. The hard part is letting the sinner go when he or she repents. And not just once, but again and again and again. That word repent is, is an important word in the passage. If a brother repents, forgive him. In this teaching of Christ, it is plain that forgiveness is to, be grant, is to be granted only after repentance or a change in, in, of mind on the part of the one who has sinned. If the brother repents, forgive him. And we may do a great deal of harm, both against the offender and the offended, and the one offended by granting just a blanket forgiveness without any indication of a change of attitude on the part of the offender. It's very, very dangerous to do that. And forgiving is not so much excusing the offender's guilt as releasing the person into what I would say God's grace and freeing ourselves to live without pain. It is, it is much for our benefit as the other person's uh, for by unhooking the offender we unhook ourselves from bitterness and from anger that can sour our lives and turn us into stumbling blocks to the people around us. You know, our forgiveness gives people a sweet taste of Christ's forgiveness. A taste that will draw them to him rather than point them away. But forgive seven times in a single day? Seven times in a single day? That's not humanly possible. Which the disciples pick up on right away. Look at that in verse 5 of the passage. The, the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus, however, reveals that the amount of faith is not the issue. Look at that. Verse 6, he replied, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, Be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. You see, this is in itself a parable in answer to the disciples' request for more faith to be able to live up to Jesus' teaching on forgiveness. And here in the word of God, faith is compared to a mustard seed. The seed is planted into the ground where it has to overcome many, many obstacles in pushing its seed leaves up through the hard, lumpy soil. A living faith is something like that. It has the power to overcome all obstacles. And even a tiny amount of faith in God can accomplish the impossible. Commentator Leon Morris pinpoints the real issue. I quote Morris, listen, I think it's good. He says this, it is not so much great faith in God that is required as faith in a great God. Let me give that to you again. It is not so much great faith in God that is required as faith in a great God. And our God is great. There's not an ounce of uncertainty in Jesus' mind that his disciples will be able to follow his command because they have the power of God on their side and with him anything is possible. May it never be said that we were the death of someone's dream, someone else's dream. 
that we crush their mustard seed, their tiny bit of faith, with faith under the, under the fearsome size of the mulberry bush or the mulberry tree, you know, a big faith. When what ifs and be carefuls and watch out start pouring out of our mouths, we can become stumbling blocks. You see, Jesus was a go for it kind of person. So let's be go for it people too. Faith and obedience lead Jesus to another subject, servanthood. Look at that, verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. Follow along. He says, suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink, and after that you may eat and drink? Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done our duty. Let's put Jesus' illustration in military terms to better understand it. Suppose a drill sergeant commands a private, make your bunk, shine your shoes. And the private immediately obeys then does the sergeant now owe the private a thank you and a favour? Well, if you know anything about the military, not in any military I have heard of, or not in any army I have heard of, that doesn't happen. The private was simply fulfilling his duty. In a similar way, true servants of Christ should not expect favours from God when they do what they're supposed to do. We can never say, Lord, I have a loving attitude today. You owe me three blessings and an answered prayer. <laughs> you see, God does not owe us gratitude at all. We owe him. He is not our servants, we are his servants. And pharisaical pride in ourselves and our own accomplishments will, will, will definitely send others sprawling for a six, but the right perspective of humility will gently aid others on their way. Church, listen carefully to me now. Too often, while we're sitting around chewing seed, waiting for God to thank us, we forget to thank him. Remember the little song by the little girl, the Collingsworth girl? On Friday night, thank you, Jesus. So often while we're sitting around waiting for God to thank us, we forget to thank him. Verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had, had leprosy met him and stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Now what you need to understand is that Jewish law swept lepers into isolated colonies and required them to tear their clothes and bare their heads and whenever anyone ventured too closely to cry out in humiliation in terms of Leviticus 13, unclean, 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 as they walked down the street. Imagine it. So they stand at a distance from Jesus. Ten tattered refugees in a war with death. And some of their features have been eaten away, some of their fingers and toes as well. 
even hands and feet. Their one hope is Jesus, whose mercy does not let them down. Verse 14. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asks, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. The lepers cry out for mercy. And I want you to notice something. Jesus didn't anoint them. Lay hands on them. Or go through any kind of ceremony, drop a drachma into the church treasury, the synagogue treasury, didn't do that. Drop a drachma in and I'll do a miracle. He simply said, go show yourself to the priests. And he did that for the priest was the one who had the, to examine the leper and pronounce him clean or unclean. So here they are. Ten are healed, nine leave and never come back. One returned to offer thanks, a Samaritan. A heretic, a half-breed, a mongrel as far as the Jews were concerned. And he was the only one who exhibited genuine faith. So Jesus blesses him, giving him a clean heart to match his fresh new skin. You know, the story compels us to think of the people who have played the role of Christ, as it were, in our lives. Our parents who gave us life and nurtured us through the difficult years. Our friends who offered us hope and encouragement. Perhaps a physician, a counselor, maybe a pastor, a teacher. Have we neglected to say? Thank you. Has our simply taking them for granted become a stumbling block to them? You know, I am reminded, church, in Romans 1.21, that unthankfulness, an unthankful heart, is a sign of apostasy. But thankfulness is one of the chief attributes of a believer. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Okay. Let's wrap our thoughts up. Now, a few of us wake up uh, in the morning and say to ourselves, well, today I'm going to trip someone up and make someone stumble, make someone fall. We very rarely wake up to, and say that, do we? But most of the time what happens is it happens unintentionally. And that's why we need to be mindful of these two points. Here's the first. It's usually not the big things that cause others to stumble but the little things. It's usually not the big things that cause others to stumble, but the little things. Jokes can be taken the wrong way. Expressions can be misunderstood. We can thoughtlessly offend someone and, and not even realize it. That's why it's important for us to pay attention to the small things. And secondly, it's usually not what we do that defends people. It's what we don't do. 
It's usually not what we do that offends people. It's what we don't do. We never actually forgive someone. We hold back an encouraging word. We don't raise our hand to serve. We forget to say thank you. In each of these ways, we can be a stumbling block to someone. But the good news is we don't have to remain that way. Stone by stone, we can tear down the barrier that we have erected. And we can be begin with the simple but powerful words. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Powerful words. Probably next to only the three most important words. I love you. I love you. Let's pray. Father, tonight we just simply acknowledge that sometimes in the way that we speak, act and think, it can be a stumbling block to others. And so often, Father, as we outlive our faith, we have ungrateful hearts. We don't pause to thank you for all that you've done for us. We don't pause to thank others. And so tonight, Father, we simply ask that as we leave this place, that we might determine not to put any stumbling block in the way of our brothers and sisters. And we pray that because of that, you would get all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory. For we ask it in the strong and precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. I hope you enjoy this closing song. Even then, he gave me one more chance to make it right. Now when heartache comes my way, I can hear my father say, we'll walk together through the dark till we see light. I need. I need. No matter the struggle or the trouble I see, when I need a fresh supply, I know He'll be passing by.
about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org Until next time, God bless.